In episode 7 of the Build a Real Robot series, we're going to hook up the motors and give DB1 a test drive. I'll also show you some wiring enhancements I made, and we'll get ready to build the motor controllers. The wheels are spinning today, so welcome to the workshop. Hello and welcome to the workshop and to episode 7 on the series of building a real robot. Now today we're back working with the navigation unit. I've got the base sitting over here beside me and I've done a little additional wiring since I saw you last time. Basically what I have done is I've wired up the power connector and so I can feed external power into the robot and I'm going to be using this power supply. This is a power supply constructed out of an ATX computer supply and you might have seen me do this on the regular drone bot workshop a little while ago. We're going to be using this to power the robot temporarily until we get some batteries for it and by using the power supply we can determine what the current requirement for those batteries are. So I've done extra wiring to hook up this connector where we're going to be feeding the power. I've made kind of an umbilical cable over here so to speak that we can get the power out of the power supply and into the robot and I want to show you some of this extra wiring first so before we get started I'm going to pull this top plate off and this show you some of the extra wiring and how I connected a few things up it also became quite evident that it's very important to test your wiring I said that at the end of the last video and I'll tell you when I went through the testing myself I found I had a wiring error I actually had crossed one of the wires on the front terminal strip over here thus shorting out the 5 volt and the ground so it could have been pretty catastrophic had I powered it up with the power supply of course I've got fuses and such in the power supply they would have just blown but it's an important thing to always test your wiring well after I show you that wiring we're going to be putting the top back on and we're going to start controlling the motors now we're going to do this two ways first of all the Cytron motor drivers have a couple of push buttons on them and those push buttons just allow you to spin the motors forward and backwards so after we put power onto it we'll just test it out to make sure everything is working there then after that I'm going to use the Arduino Mega that I've got on the board here because I don't have my motor controller built yet but we're going to temporarily use the Mega just to feed in some pulse width modulation into the motors and we're going to make DB1 move back and forth so for the first time DB1 is actually going to be moving around on the floor and I'm sure you're thrilled about that and finally we will be discussing the motor controller I've had several questions about why are you using a separate board to control the motor where you can just do it with the Mega and obviously today I'm going to do it with the Mega I will be answering those questions and the motor controller is going to be the subject of the next few videos and right now the motor controller itself is on the other workbench being prototyped but uh, it'll be making an appearance very shortly on DB1 so let me pull the top off over here and we'll take a look at some of the wiring I've added and then we'll move on to start working with the motors so here once again we have the top unit off. I just want to show you a few changes I made. The most notable one is this terminal strip back over here. Now this is connected to this connector at the back and I've brought it up. And again this will make it very versatile when I want to change the wiring to use the connector as a charger port instead of a power port. And right now I've just got the wires coming up and I've got double wires going down to the uh, terminal strips at the bottom over here. The ones that distribute the power. Power. I just did that just for some extra current handling capability now again I've used 18 gauge wire over here uh, it would be nice to have used 16 gauge wire that would probably have been better but I think the 18 will be all right the umbilical cord I'm using which uh, uses the connector this one over here this is a speaker wire it's 16 gauge speaker wire that I'm using to come from my power supply so I don't anticipate a lot of voltage drop and with an ohm meter there's really no appreciable resistance that I'm measuring now one thing that you may be able to see is that the uh, two positive ones the 12 volt and the uh, 5 volt one I'll just tilt this up maybe a bit better so you can see that they've got some uh, shields on them some plastic shields they came with the connectors and I've used that I've also 
done that with the connector that's underneath here. It's also got a plastic shield. And I've done that as well on the tower. I didn't do it to the middle one. The middle one is the ground. And I didn't put the shield on because I didn't want it to rub against the wires that were coming in over here. And I figure since it's ground, I don't need to shield it. Now, one thing I haven't done yet and I'm considering doing is grounding the chassis. The only concern I had was with the terminal strips here. If I, for example, had a screwdriver or some tool that accidentally slipped I could be shorting the two of them out but in reality I probably wouldn't have that as a problem first of all they've now got these plastic shields on them and secondly I really don't think I'd be working on these with a screwdriver while it was actively powered but nonetheless it was a concern of mine but I may indeed end up grounding the chassis a little bit later on now this board over here does not have a plastic shield on it and that's because it sits underneath uh, this board over here and it sits quite nicely although I did add a couple of washers a washer under every one of the spacers over here just to elevate it a bit more of course I could use a longer spacer and as you can see I've already wired this board up and I've got a power connector going to another connector which I've wired over here I wired one more three pin connector to it and I've labeled all of my connectors as well I'm not sure if you can see that and I also for that matter did some labeling you probably can't see too well on the bottom here for all of these and I've done that on the tower as well which I won't be showing you right now I've added labels on the board over here as well these are for the four fuses so I know what they are and um, I've also put labels inside here just so that I know what all the pins do over here. So uh, labeling is an important thing because, of course, I'm building it now. I know where all the wires go, but in the future that may not be true. So I just wanted to show you some of that additional wiring, specifically the wiring for this that I've done. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this top board back on and we'll give the motors a little test. Okay, so I've put the navigation control unit back on to the back of the robot and I've uh, got it powered up through the umbilical cord. You might be able to see the power lights now on the Cytron motor controllers. Now the Cytron controllers have a built-in motor test. They have two push buttons that let you just spin the wheels in one direction or in the other direction. So we're going to give it a quick test. Now I'm going to lift it up so that it doesn't actually travel anywhere. And I'm going to press one of the buttons. And as you can see, the wheel is spinning. And the other direction it is spinning as well. There's also a little indicator light here that tells you which direction it's going in. And let's just try the other one to make certain it's okay. And it seems to be fine. Now one other thing I want to mention is that I thought these wheels were coming very close to the chassis. They weren't actually touching, but they were very, very close. So I inserted a 1 8 inch spacer on top of the hub. And so now the wheel has the spacer in between itself and the hub, and it's brought everything else out an eighth of an inch more. And I think that's a bit better, although, as I said, it wasn't actually touching. I just thought it was a little precaution that I could make on there. So now that we've seen this, let's go and put it down on the floor. We're going to run some test code here on this Arduino Mega, my bright brand new Mega with the yellow pins on it. And uh, we'll just use that to power the Cytron motor controllers to send PWM to them. And we'll make the robot move back and forth. And so we're about to see DB1's first test drive. All right, well, I'm down here on the floor with DB1. I'm going to give it a test drive. So I've got my Arduino Mega doing the PWM for it. Now I've just got some jumper wires connected to the two Cytron controllers and I'm powering the Arduino Mega using its USB connector and just using the USB out that's actually intended for the Raspberry Pi. Eventually I'm going to put a shield like this one on top of the Arduino Mega and put a connector on here for power and power it directly with that, but I'm not doing it now. Now the sketch that I wrote is really basic. It just basically is going to move the uh, wheels forward for one second, 
then in reverse for a second, and then it's going to move them in the opposite directions for about two seconds, which of course will cause the robot to spin. But one thing I've noticed during my test drives is I've got a bit of a weight problem, and the weight problem is not the one you would expect where everything is too heavy. It's actually too light. I don't have enough weight down on the front here to get good traction. I don't know if it's a weight thing or if it's uh, the wheels themselves might, uh, I might need to use different wheels with better traction. So I'm going to show it to you a couple of times. Now, the way I wrote my sketch, everything is done in the setup, so all I have to do is press the reset button to get it to go through its cycle. There's nothing in the loop, and then I can do it over again. So I'll do it the first time without any weight on the front. You'll see it move, but as you'll see, it's going to be a bit erratic. And then I'll apply some weight to the front of the robot, and you can see how that improves things. So here we go. There's a two second delay after I press the button before it starts, by the way. Oops. You can sort of see when it spun around over there, it didn't really spin the way that I wanted it to. So I found that if I put some weight on, now here's an extreme example of some weight, some uh, printer paper. And let's put a ream of paper on the front of this and press the button and wait two seconds for it to go again. And as you can see, that's much, much better. And so I'm going to have to attend to that, obviously. Now, one other thing I was thinking, of course, is I don't have the tower on right now, nor do I have batteries in the compartment. I don't want to put the tower on at the moment. This is too much of a hassle to do that. But I've got these two batteries. Now, obviously, they're not the ones I'd be powering the robot with. And they probably don't even weigh as much as the batteries I'm going to use. But I put them in the compartment that might give you an idea of even adding a little bit of weight, what that does to it. So let's go again. And even that seemed to help a bit. So I'm confident that with a bit of balancing and uh, I can probably get it to work with the wheels it's got. If not, I'll look at getting wheels with better traction. But at any rate, that was DB1's first test drive. Now one thing I promised that I would discuss today is the motor controller, specifically why am I building a separate motor controller when, as we've already seen, the Arduino Mega is perfectly capable of controlling the motor. Well, I want to discuss why I'm doing that right now. And remember, this is my design philosophy. It may not necessarily be yours, and that's fine too. I'm just showing you how I am building the robot. And what I want to do is show you one of these little robots. We've seen these before many times. And this just has an Arduino Uno on it that performs everything. In this case, the Arduino Uno is controlling the motors. It's controlling the ultrasonic sensor, it's controlling the line following sensor at the bottom of the robot. And that's great for a small little robot. However, the Uno is only capable of doing so many things at once. And the same holds true for people. Like, for example, what I do over here in the DroneBot workshop, I'm a one-man operation. I do everything over here. You could say I'm the CEO, I'm the technician, I'm the cameraman, I'm the video producer, and I'm also the janitor. Whereas if this was a larger company, and I've worked for many large companies, I've also worked for two governments in two different countries, it's a different story. In a large company, you've got people who dedicate themselves to specific tasks and they report to people who are also dedicated to specific tasks. So for example, you may be a technician working on something in the company or a programmer working on something and you will report to a manager. And it's not that she isn't capable of doing your job, but she has other things that she's going to do and in turn she reports to another layer above her, like a director or 
somebody like that. Well, that's the philosophy I've been using with DB1. I want to have intelligent sensors and intelligent I.O. devices and let them all take care of one specific task. And so I want one device that can just control the motor, a device that I can just basically say, move the motor forward so many revolutions of the wheel or move the robot forward so many millimeters or spin the robot around or something and it will take care of that without me having to figure out exactly how many pulses I've got to get back from my rotary encoder to do that. My motor controller can do that and the Arduino Mega can just instruct the controller through I2C in order to do that. Now, um, my motor controller design, why am I using two of them then? Why not just use one Arduino Nano? After all, as many have pointed out, I only need one interrupt from the rotary encoder because the second interrupt would just simply tell me the direction it's spinning and I already know what direction it's spinning. I'm the one controlling it. Well, the answer is I actually have a use for two interrupts on each motor. Now, one of the interrupts is indeed coming back from the rotary encoder the other interrupt is going to be an emergency stop. Whenever I get an interrupt on this line, I stop the motors right away. And there are many situations in which I would need to do that. One, for example, is that I've suddenly detected that there is an object immediately in front of me that wasn't in front of me a second ago. I want to stop those motors right now. So that's why it's second interrupt. And so this is my philosophy of building the motor controller. Again, it may not equate to your philosophy, but it's the way that I'm doing it. And in the next episode, we're going to start getting into the design of that actual motor controller. So at any rate, there's my explanation. I hope that that was suitable. Okay, well that about does it for today. Uh, now we've got DB1 moving. The next step is to actually build the motor controller. So the next time we get together, that is exactly what we are going to be doing. Now, if you need the sketch that I used on the Arduino to drive the motors, you can find that on the article that accompanies this video. There's a link right below the video that'll take you there. And while you're on the DroneBotWorkshop.com website, if you have not joined the newsletter, please do so because I will be announcing more news about the robot via the newsletter. A lot of you have sent me emails about the wonderful robots that you're building, and I have to admit I'm absolutely amazed amazed at some of the construction that's out there. Uh, I've got letters that show me full-sized R2-D2s and other robotic creations that you're all creating and I've been thinking about a way of getting us all together so to speak and uh, talking about building robots and exchanging ideas and so I'm going to be uh, talking about that in a couple of the newsletters that are to follow. So if you're not a newsletter member, please join up with the newsletter. Also, if you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel, please do me a favor and do that. Just click the subscribe button below the video and subscribe. I would very much appreciate that. So until the next time we get together, please take good care of yourselves, and I hope to see you again very soon here in the DroneBot Workshop. Goodbye for now. Mm -hmm.